This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Boomers. People should buy less Costa coffees and go on less holidays. We worked hard and yeah. we didn't have a car, we didn't have a colour television. Seem to want to focus on their phones more than listening and learning. Millennial and Gen Z are the most educated, the most hardworking, yet the worst paid generation. We are far more productive than past generations. We are the forefront of social causes like climate change, which is like an existential threat. We can't afford a home, we can barely pay rent by ourselves, we can't imagine having kids, and because of all of that, we're also very prone to develop mental illnesses. I mean, the list goes on and on. Given what I've just said, it makes total sense to hold resentment towards a generation that had it easier in terms of work, housing, etc. The term OK Boomer became popular in 2019, especially after New Zealander representative Chloe Swalbrick said it in Parliament. OK Boomer. Now one observation that we can make is that the generational war has become an analytical tool, a framework from which to think, to theorize, etc. I mean, just type Gen Z, Millennials or Boomers online and you'll find countless articles on these topics. A French guy named Brice Couturier went as far as writing an entire essay titled OK Millennials, a response to OK Boomer, he explained. Couturier, a boomer himself, said he wrote it because he was attacked on Twitter by woke keyboard warriors. And to be fair, what motivated him to write the book in the first place is as bad as the book itself. It is very misinformed because he didn't talk to young people. He talked straight out of his ass, to put it simply, which is a common pattern among old white men essayists, I can't lie. I mean, it is so misinformed that even the title of the book is wrong. Because the generation Couturier complains about is not millennials, it's Generation Z. Now you see where I'm going, you saw the title of the video, you saw the thumbnail. My argument is precisely that the generational war is pointless. I most notably realized that after I watched two Gen Z versus Boomers debates, the Jubilee debate and the Dr. Phil debate. These videos were very boring and for me the reasons why they were so boring is that there were too much diversity of opinions within both groups. There was always one Gen Z agreeing with one Boomer and vice versa. Every time a Gen Z or Boomer tried to generalize about the other generation, someone would stand up and say not all Gen Z or not all boomers and they were kind of right to do that. What struck me even more, especially in the Dr. Phil debate, was that Gen Z participants ended up debating themselves more than they debated boomers. Among that Gen Z panel were a proper lefty, the anti woke gay and some influencers, so of course they're going to argue, how can you put all those people in the same box? In fact, when I looked online for academic articles on the generational war, I couldn't find a lot of things, and the things I found usually had a disclaimer, like we understand that there is a lot of diversity within each generation, but blah blah blah. I mean, yeah, using the generational war as an analytical tool is flawed. These categories, boomers, millennials, Gen Z, are primarily used for marketing purposes, for advertisers to help them better identify their audience. But they have been adapted in the world of journalism and the online world because they have become clickbait buzzwords. Now, I'm not saying that people only use these categories for clout because there are some cases in which they are useful. However, there are many, many, many cases in which the generational war is used in a way that does not make any sense. Like, look at this TikTok video I found when I was preparing this. Do you want to know who raised the most mentally ill generation of our time? Boomers. And they don't want to take any responsibility for this. So Danielle uses the generational war framework to explain why millennials are depressed. What she implies is that boomers, as parents, are responsible for millennials' poor mental health. Sure, boomers probably weren't as equipped to deal with mental illness in comparison to parents today. But what Danielle does here is that she psychologizes social problems. Gen Z and millennials aren't depressed because of bad parenting or childhood trauma. That's what neoliberals want you to think, that it's a personal issue and that your parents or you are responsible for it. They are depressed because they grew up and have to survive in a neoliberal society that is making us all very unhappy. Mental illnesses are a natural response to Gen Z and millennials' uh, difficulties to imagine a sustainable future for themselves and for the planet, for everybody else, really. The generational war framework here is counterproductive. It psychologizes, therefore it individualizes social and economic problems. Okay, let's take another example. Here is an article written by millennial journalist Sarah Green-Michael for the Harvard Business Review. 
in it, the journalist looked at the study that showed that millennials are more likely to agree with four statements uh, they use to assess work martyrdom. Let me list them. No one else at my company can do the work while I'm away. I want to show complete dedication to my company and job. I don't want others to think I am replaceable. I feel guilty for using my paid time off. So these are all statements that millennials were more likely to agree with. And so the journalist got curious about it. She wanted to understand why millennials acted that way, why are they workaholics, or why do they see themselves as work martyrs. She says, I have a theory. One of the few major differences that has been found in longitudinal studies between today's young people and yesterday's young people is how they agree with the statement, I am an important person. Narcissism is thus one of the few true differences that we've seen between the generations over time. I'm not going to spend any time debunking this. As we mentioned at the beginning of the video, young people's negative feelings towards work are completely legitimate and their commitment to it isn't the result of narcissism. Like, no, what I'm interested in here is that the author of the article is a millennial. She's not a boomer, but her take, her theory, it's just the same type of BS boomers come up with. So now it's pretty clear that this is not a war between Gen Z millennials and boomers. It's a political battle that transcends generations. Using a class political framework to analyze those uh, socioeconomic inequalities makes so much more sense than using a generational framework. Sure, it is true that older people are more likely to vote right-wing and to be financially stable, and the contrary is true for young people, but... What is our goal? Is our goal to create further division between two very diverse groups for the sake of engagement? Or is it to seriously work on decreasing socioeconomic inequalities? If you answered no to the first question and yes to the second, then you agree with me. We must ditch advertisers buzzwords and talk about class and politics instead. Attacks directed at young people who we know it are more likely to vote left-wing are political attacks against the left. When I hear that young people don't want to work anymore, that they are oversensitive, narcissistic, or that they should stop buying Starbucks coffees and uh, whatnot, avocado toast uh, to save money, what I understand is rather something like left-wing people don't want to work, left-wing people are obsessed with identity, or left-wing people can't save money and that's why they are poor. Using the language of generational wars is a right-wing political strategy, a dog whistle, meaning a coded language that allows to one, reach across the political spectrum without appearing too political, therefore too polarizing, and two, infantilize the left. As we saw with the Harvard Business Review, some Gen Z, some Millennials also use that dog whistle for the same purposes. I want to quickly remind you that 35 to 45 percent of them voted for Trump's right-wing agenda in 2020. In France, the country I live in, 53 to 63 percent of Gen Z and Millennials chose a candidate on the right side of the political spectrum. We see how millions of young people are drawn to the alt-right, the manosphere, toxic hustle culture, online grifting, and conspiracy theories. We can go on and pretend our generation is the good one and past generations are the bad ones because it's much more complex than that. Again, it's not about generations, it's about politics and class. So what about boomers? Well, 23% of boomers voted for French left-wing candidates and 48% of American boomers voted for Biden. And yes, I know Biden is not exactly a lefty, but you know what I mean. I personally met some of these French leftist boomers a few months ago when I interviewed people at the protests in Paris for More Perfect Union. I also saw a bunch of them when I went to La Fête de l'Humanité, a festival organized by the French Communist Party. They don't watch video essays, but they went to every single conference there. Which is pretty much the same thing. I mean, a lot of these boomers are eager to learn new things and to adapt. In France, a lot of them were radicalized during the events of May 68, which deeply marked the political history of my country. In May 68, students, unionists and workers gathered in the streets of Paris in France to resist the rise of the capitalist society and US imperialism. Sociologist Julie Pagy searched for those people who took part in May 68, but more specifically, average people, and see what they do now. She did so because a lot of people who were at the forefront of the movement turned to neoliberalism, which could make you think that the saying, um, if you are not a liberal, when you are young, you have no heart, and if you are not a conservative, when you are old, you have no brain, or something like that, is true. But Julie Pagy shows that it is absolutely not true. The activists who turned into neoliberals were very likely to do so because they were already part of political parties or public power structures. 
However, Julie Paget shows that the majority of people who got involved into May 68 continued to hold left-wing values, to unionize, etc. Some of them risked losing their jobs or were penalized by their bosses. They had an idea of what a left-wing society would look like, and they fought for it with their body and soul, even if that meant that they would financially struggle for the rest of their lives. Their lives, their fights are truly inspiring, and I feel like as young people, it is important to um, keep in mind that heritage and to recognize how much it influences our current fights. I blush very easily, and there are a lot of people passing in front of the bar, and sometimes they stop and they go, oh, look at this little girl that she's filming, and it makes me blush, God damn it. I don't like the phrase identity politics, but I'm gonna use it so that you know what I'm referring to. No matter if they are left-wing or right-wing, boomers usually misunderstand identity politics and that does not help us move beyond the generational war. Feminism, anti-racism, gender identity are very polarizing topics because they have just entered political discourses in comparison to something like class struggle. Women's studies, black studies, gender studies, are rather new. They only emerged in the second half of the 20th century in American and European universities. Only a minority of people really understand the concepts and frameworks that were created in those fields of study, and that is why it is so easy to delegitimize them or to use them to mock political opponents. Now I want to make a distinction between boomers who are opposed to identity politics and they will let you know every time they can, and boomers who are also opposed to identity politics but mostly due to ignorance. To see that sort of distinction and what we can do about it, I want to show you an episode of a TV reality show where they trapped eight participants for 48 hours in a cottage in Switzerland. I found it thanks to French streamer Cassandre, I um, highly recommend his streams. To make it spicy, they invited a non-binary person, a trans man, a female normie, a lesbian, a pickup artist, a guy in gender studies, an old feminist, and a former pro-feminist turned misogynist. What a lovely panel. So yeah, but today I want to focus on one person in particular, Maria, the feminist boomer. She describes herself as a left-wing feminist who believes in social justice, but she also added that she felt a little bit uncomfortable with how the feminist movement evolved and what it now stands for. Later during the apéro, she explains that she doesn't understand why people feel the need to identify as non-binary, as queer, lesbian, etc. Leon, another participant and a trans man, explained to her that it is a privilege not having to define yourself using those labels because those who are part of the minority groups have to prove that they exist, as Cassandre rightly explained. Even Leon, who passed as a cis man, has had the privilege to not have to say that he's a trans man when he introduced himself. Like, it's really funny to see the face of Maria when she understands that Leon is a trans man. She's like, woo, how many times have I been tricked? The thing is that she can tell she's not evil. She probably never met a trans person in her entire life. Later in the episode, she thought that drag show came from the French verb draguer, which means to flirt. And even later, she said that she didn't like when her daughter uh, wears like crop tops or things like that because She's afraid that young boys are gonna sexualize her. So for me, Maria is part of this category of boomers who are anti-woke, but want to be educated, or at least are open for change. Like, she got it wrong on many things related to gender, but not in a purposely harmful way. Like the male boomer of the show who refused to acknowledge that Leon is a man. Maria, on the other hand, listened and asked questions and it is our job, in those instances, to educate. Especially if we call ourselves social justice advocates, and especially if we had the privilege to be educated on those topics. So going back to Maria. While Maria believes that class is more important than gender, race, etc., she says that working class people don't care about those things. This take is extremely common among left-wing boomers, and not just boomers. So I want to pause a little bit and use it as an example. For me, this take stems from the fact that LGBTQ plus movements, feminist movements, anti-racism movements look like they are pushed by the urban educated left, which means that it looks like they are the ones concerned by those topics. These fights get associated with them and become unrelatable to average people, including working classes who only care about putting money on their plate and paying the bills at the end of the month. While this take, in my opinion, is misconstrued. First, it is important to state that working classes have always been involved in identity politics fights. Sure, the people who lead them, whose voices are heard, who are interviewed, who go on TV, 
all the most privileged ones of the group. But the working class women, working class queer people, the black working class, they were there on the ground. They've always been there. They are the foundation of these movements, doing all the work behind the scenes, ensuring the stability of these movements through time. Maria's take implies that gender, for example, is not part of working class life, but that is not true. If you've been in working class circles or if you are working class yourself, you know that the pressure to perform gender Masculinity if you are men, femininity if you are women, is strong. Working class queer people, yes, they exist, Maria, know it all too well. People in their environment quickly made them understand that they did not fit in those boxes and had to do something about it. I mean, working classes experience homophobia, transphobia, misogyny, racism at work, at home, in trade unions. It is part of their lives and it is wrong to say that they are not conscious about it. So yeah, that's what I would say to Maria if I was in the show. To be fair, in that show, Leon took the time to share his life story and educate Maria on what it's like to be trans. She listened, asked questions, and I'm sure she left the show with the knowledge that trans people aren't threatening the feminist movement like she probably used to think 48 hours beforehand. So this was a rather enriching, positive experience for Maria. Of course, we can't trap every single uh, anti woke boomer in a Swiss cottage for 48 hours. That's not possible. On top of that, some boomers are really, really opposed to change. So it's useless to devote energy and time to convince them. When we feel like there's a chance that we might do, then we need to jump on the occasion. Empathy and education. This is what the left is historically known for. This is what makes us powerful. No matter the generation we belong to, we need to insist on the fact that we leftists all want the same thing. We want people to be respected, emancipated. We want to remove all barriers preventing human being to live authentically. And that is not selfish, that is not idealist. That is simply the basis for building a future together. That's it for today, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, as always, the conversation continues in the comments section. Don't forget to like, to subscribe if it's not already done. I would like to thank my patrons for their support and a special thank to top tier patrons Patrick Riley, Boris, Ria, Joey Esguera, Rémi Trebizond, Toki, Corigi, Tristan, Patricia, Ian, Donage, Alex, Ren, Manuel, and Perry. Before I leave, I need to talk to you about today's sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace is an all in one platform for building your brand and growing your business online. You can create your own website around your preferred aesthetic from a catalogue of templates and use it as a landing platform for all the activity you do. YouTube, online shop, blog, podcast, photography, etc. Once that is set up, you can connect all your social media accounts and share content between different platforms. Squarespace can also help you create effective email campaigns to really connect with your community. Finally, they had this very cool feature where you can connect and learn from other creators like Adrienne Raquel, who will show you how you can best use the platform. If you feel like Squarespace is made for you and you want to check it out, go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you've experimented and you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash alicecapel to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thank you Squarespace for sponsoring the video. And yeah, that's it. Salut.